19 uh, verses 1 through chapter 20 verse 27. That's where we're on, and it's called Kedoshem. Now, if we broke down the word, what do you think we got here? Well, what's K Kodesh, right? And you got Kodesh Shem. So Kodesh Shem means holy ones and or saints. So who's he talking to? Okay. Us, you, everybody that believes, everybody's a believer. So we know that the nation of Israel that we're talking about, but the verse that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about several of them, but this is probably, in, in chapter 19, is probably the most famous verse of all because it's something we talk about a bunch. And it's in verse, I believe, verse 9, it's either verse 19 or verse 18 in, let me look here. And we're going to hang out here for a while, beginning actually in verse 17, if you have the TLV Bible, verse 17. But first, before we get there, here's what I want, I want to look at, verse 1 um, of chapter 19. It says, Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak uh, to all the congregation of Israel and tell them, You shall be Kedoshem, I, for I, Adonai, Right, your God am holy. So he really kind of says a double, there's a double thing. There's a be holy or be holy ones, Kedoshem, be holy ones or be saints, right? For I am holy. So really we've talked about this a time or two, right? What, what, does, what does Kodesh mean? Now we know Kedoshem, right? It's holy ones. So what does what does Kodesh mean, huh? To be holy it means to be holy. And there's a longer, more extensive de definition for it, which means what in the New Testament? To not only be holy, but to be what? To live a set apart life, right? So what God's saying here to Israel, He's saying, "Hey, live as holy ones. Live as set apart ones. Why?" Because I'm a set apart God. What's interesting that we have to understand here is like, especially in the book of Leviticus, which is really, really foundational, is that you, we have to remember and understand kind of where Israel is. And I don't mean is as in location, but where they are kind of spiritually right now, right? Where did they just come out of? They just came out of Egypt, right? I mean, we say just, but it's been a little bit, but they came out of Egypt. So inside Egypt, they were there for how long? How long were they in Egypt? Do anybody remember? Four over 400 years, that's right. And during that time, what happened was, while they were there, they adapted to a lot of the Egyptian ways, the pagan worships, the, um, uh, and what we're going to see in this chapter, which is very interesting, you can look at chapter 19 and go over to the book of James around chapter 4, beginning around chapter 4, and you'll see some really interesting connections. A lot of people believe that when James, book of Jacob actually, was written, is that he was actually using Kedoshem as the example of it when he was writing it, because there's a lot of, lot of things that are connected in the book of James as well as in this chapter 19. So what you're going to see here, you're going to see some repetitive, uh, a lot, a matter of fact, here all the way through Deuteronomy, you're going to see a lot of repetitiveness. And it's not because, well, it is. It's not because God is forgetful. Why, why do you think God's continually repeating the same things? We forget. Do what? We forget. We forget. Not only do we forget, we it renews our mind, but there's another. You're right. We forget, but think about it. I see it as like him trying to emphasize constantly. Because why? It's important. They came out of Egypt. Four 400 years of this. So their whole mindset is all about this pagan stuff, right? So there's some things that you read that you go, well, why did God do that? Well, if you don't understand the connection between Egypt and the nation of Israel, it doesn't make sense. Absolutely none. You would be like, well, that doesn't make sense. Why would God say that? Um, and so uh, we're going to deal with a little bit of that, but primarily I want to focus on verse 17 through 18 because, man, this is so good. If you needed a Bible, if you needed a chapter to summarize what it means to love God and what it means to love others, Leviticus chapter 19 is the chapter. It is the book, man, that will help us understand what real love looks like. Because he hits it. I mean, he hits it hard, right? So he says, each one of you is to respect his mother, his father, and keep the Shabbat. I am Adonai your God. What is he doing right there? 
What's he doing? We're not in Deuteronomy 6, right? But what is he doing? What are these? The Shema. These are the Shema, but not only the Shema, what are they? Honor your mom and dad? That's a 10. It's the big 10 suggestions. Nobody got that. <laughs> the 10 suggestions, not the 10 commandments. <laughs> They're just suggestions. Christians don't have to follow them. Christians don't have to obey them. Verse 4, right? Do not turn to idols or make molten gods for yourself. I'm Adonai, your God. Remember, this is what they did in Egypt. Egypt, man, they made a god for everything. If the wind blew and the crops grew, they were like, hey, let's make a god to that, man. That had to help him, right? Right? I mean, it was everything they made a god to, so they molted image. And, of course, it's a good reminder for what happened at Mount Sinai, remember? They took all the gold. They melted it all down. Good job, guys. Way to, way to, way to impress. Verse 5, when you bring a sacrifice, a fellowship offering to Adonai, you're to offer it. Um, it's, it's so that it may be accepted. It's to be eaten the same day. He goes into some details there with that. Uh, you go into verse 9, we see a lot of the, when you reap the harvest of your land, watch this. You're not to reap in the very corners of your field, nor are you to gather the gleanings of your harvest. Now, why would that be important? So people can have it. It was for the people, right? It was for the who? Poor people. Poor people. But here's something maybe you didn't know. There's a commentary that they believe that the reason why they did that is part of fertility in Egypt, part of the uh, fertility sacrifice was to leave the corners of the fields for the gods so that the gods could eat. And God says, uh-uh, that's not how we're rolling. We're going to roll it differently. How we're going to roll is we're going to leave that for people who don't have it. What, what's a great story that we know in our hearts that talks about the four corners like that and the, the outer fringes of, uh, of a harvest field? Big story. It's actually probably one of the greatest reflections of Gentile and Jew. Ruth. The book of Ruth. The story of Ruth. The story of Ruth. Man, Ruth was at these corners, gathering, gathering in the grain from the corners that had been left when the king noticed her and uh, kind of like, hey, hey, call her up, give me her number, <laughs> let me DM her, yeah. right? <laughs> okay, something like that, right? All right. So he says in verse, uh, what are we, verse 12, you're not to swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God, I'm Adonai. We have to be careful, man, that, you know, God is showing them something. Look, he's not just saying I'm Adonai, he's saying I'm God. So don't take my name in vain. Don't use it profusely. You know, and we see that today in today's modern church. How would that apply to today? Well, that's for Leviticus, but how would it apply to it? How do we see it happening today? How about people coming with a, a word from the Lord? I have a word from the Lord for you. Right? I hear that a lot. God has given me a word, but it doesn't match my life, right? And it's like, well, why couldn't God give me the word? Praise God. You know, I'm, I'm kind of listening. And so I'm, it's not to say that there are not, you know, God doesn't, sh you know, do that. Obviously, God does. There's prophecies. But a lot of people, man, seem to take that in vain. And they use you know, hey, I got a word from God, and especially pastors tend to use that a little bit too much, I think. You're not to oppress your neighbor, nor rob him. Good idea. The wages of a hired servant are not to remain with you all night until the morning. This is all about honoring people. This is all about respect. This is all about loving God. And watch, we'll see here in a minute. You're not to curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind. That's a good idea, right? Dude's walking down the street, you throw something in front of him that he can't see and have him trip over it, right? Uh, you're to do no injustice in judgment. You're not to be partial towards the poor, nor show favoritism towards the great. But you're to judge your neighbor with fairness. You're not now. Now remember, everybody say, "Don't judge. Stop judging me." Right? We're supposed to judge with fairness. That's actually not judging. It's like you're supposed to like use wisdom. You know, you're supposed to have wisdom. The Bible says, "Be wise as a serpent." But uh, be wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove. So we're, when we talk about judgment, we're talking about making, like, like if somebody in here was a thief, and I'm like, uh, hey, can I borrow 100 bucks? Probably not. Not going to be like something I'm going to look out for, right? you got to use 
good judgment. You're not to go up and down as a talebearer. We've already talked about that when we talked about um, the leprosy and the uh, all of that, right? That that talebearers among your people, you're not to endanger the life of your neighbor. I am Adonai. Isn't it amazing how he puts those two together? He says, don't be a talebearer and what? Don't endanger your neighbor. Are they connected? Yes. I believe they are. Absolutely. Because you can endanger someone's life. You can ruin someone's reputation. You can ruin somebody's stature. You can ruin somebody. You know, so our job is not to be, we shouldn't be tail bearers, rapid, rapid. Man, I seen, you, you see what Cecil did the other day? Man, I couldn't believe it. Praise the Lord. Now, here's the part that I want to get really, really get into. You are not to hate your brother in your heart. Instead, you are to firmly rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You are not to take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am Adonai. So God shows us what real love is. Now there's a sequence here of things that I think we need to hang out with for a little bit, right? And that is these three things. Number one, in 17 it says you're not to hate your brother in your heart. Now that's interesting. What did Jesus say? As a man thinketh. As a man thinks in his heart, yes. Not quite the right place we're going, but yes. Um, what else did Jesus say about, remember that he said uh, about murder, what did he say? It's equal to hating your brother. It's equal to hating your brother. So he said that murder and hate are connected. In the Leviticus where Jesus, let me tell you something. Everything that Jesus taught, everything that Jesus almost said, especially when he refuted the Pharisees and Sadducees, always came from the Torah. Always came from the Torah. He did not say, and I know it says, I give a new commandment, I give to you. It wasn't an actual new commandment. It may have been a new commandment for the Pharisees that were listening to it, but it was not a new commandment. And that was to love your enemies, right? We're commanded to love enemies, even back here in the book of Leviticus. So then why did Jesus say that in the book of, in the New Testament? It is written. Huh? It is written. it is written. But what did he say? All through scripture you'll hear Jesus say, especially when he's refuting someone, is he'll say what? He'll say, have you not read? Have you not read the scriptures? I mean, even Dustin was preaching on this um, on Sunday. Have you not read the scriptures? Have you not heard what the Bible says? What he's doing, he's checking these Pharisees, right? Because these Pharisees, I'm going to be talking about this this weekend. The Pharisees, man, they studied this thing. They knew what the word said, right? But something very interesting is catching my eye right here. I want to see if you notice that in verse 17. Look at what it says. Where are we not to hate? In our hearts. That's right. Now, what's the next paragraph? Or what next, next sentence after that? What's that say? Instead, instead, you are to firmly rebuke your neighbor. Now, watch this. And not bear sin because of him. What does that mean? What does it mean not to bear sin? Now, look at this. This is a process that God is showing us. All the way back, as holy people, he is giving us a process of how to deal with issues. Think about it. What's the first thing we're not... Go ahead. Jesus said, speak truth in it. Speak truth in your heart. That's right. Speak the truth. So I can hate, I just can hate my heart. I can hate something. I can be not like something. I can say, man, this is not cool, right? This is garbage. I'm not going to do this, but I'm not going to let hate get into my heart. Now, he tells us how we are to do, how do we deal with that hate in our heart so that hate doesn't settle in our heart. What's it say? What's the first thing we're supposed to do? Love. Rebuke. Oh, God. Isn't that what it says? Mm -hmm. It says, don't harbor hate in your heart, but do what? Now here it says rebuke, but what it's really meaning is, is that if you have, if you have ill, what did Jesus say? If you have, what? Offense from someone, what are you supposed to do? Go to them. Go to them. Rebuke them. Yeah. You're supposed to go to that brother. You're supposed to go to that sister. That, that'll keep you from being a tail bearer. Yeah. Right? So the way we keep hate from entering into our heart, number one, is that if we have a problem with someone, we're to go and openly say, hey, yeah. you did something wrong or you've offended me or you hurt me. And, that's, and Jesus says the exact same thing in the New Testament. He says, if you have alms or, or a problem with one another, matter of fact, he says, if you're in worship, if you're up here and you're worried, oh, you're, man, we got reckless love being sang today, right? We're like, oh, what a great song. 
And he says, if you remember you have a problem with your brother or your sister, you are to stop. Don't even worship God. But do what? Go to, Go to him and make it right. That's right. Make it right. Hold that up. He didn't say stop. He said, hold that up. Go make amends. And then come back. Why? So that you're not a stumbling block. And I'm not a stumbling block. Right? So the whole idea here is dealing with offense. Why do people begin to hate things? Because they're offended. They're offended. People get offended by everything. My goodness. We get offended. What's the next step? What's it say? Instead, you are to firmly rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of them. What's the sin? What sin will you bear? Vengeance. Vengeance, maybe. That could be a, a sin. What else? You read that. Huh? Hatred. Hatred. Absolutely. He just told us. Don't hate. Instead, rebuke so that you don't hold sin in your heart. We're worried about, though, in our culture today, though, we get so bent out of shape because we're worried about offending people. Well, what if they, what if they reject me? Let them re they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting what they did. And if you're healthy and you walk to, this will help so many people that struggle with anxiety, fear, trying to, trying to you know, um, be a people pleaser, right? Instead, if they'll just stop doing all that, man, and just do what the Bible says to do. When we're offended, now I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to offend people. Matter of fact, the Bible says this. Um, somebody can uh, check me on. I can, yes, I can Google it. It says that any person who's not offended in word and deed, the same as a perfect person. What's that say? What's that mean? What's it say about all of us? Anybody, ain't nobody qualified to throw no stone. <laughs> we're all gonna, we're all gonna offend at some point. Right? And if all we do is walk around with that offense sitting on our shoulders and then it rests in our heart, we're going to become hatred. We're going to become talebearers. We're going to become angry. And then what's going to do is going to divide God's people. Remember, this is directed to all of us. We're saints. We're holy ones. We're, we're, we're Kodesh. We're holy. Our lives, and that's what this whole Leviticus is about, is God saying, hey, you got to live a set-apart life. you got to look different. you got to live differently than everybody else does. And that's, that's difficult because we have pressures of the world. we got pressures of everybody else around us, don't we? You know, you got to look. Well, I'm going to look different. I'm going to look different. I'm going to look odd. I'll be the odd man out, right? I'm reminded about uh, someone told me this, and Dustin knows who it was. I'm not going to mention his name because I didn't get his permission. But he was telling us about how he was trying to help someone, and uh, and it goes really good with I think with what we're talking about. He was trying to help someone, and uh, they were there. It was a carload of people going to lunch or something, and they were they were getting ready to go. And as they tried to pull out of the driveway from their business, there was a vehicle sitting there, and so kind of the guys were like, hey, you know, go around them. Let's go eat. Let's go eat. Let's go eat. And um, Steve. Even in the car was like, hey, I just said his name. I'm sorry. We'll edit that out. So he, he was like, he wanted to, you know, just, hey, well, let's wait. Let's go see what's going on. And when he went out there to check, right, um, the guy had, I guess, ran out of gas or had some car problems. And so rather than just leave, you know, he said, hey, let's help this guy out, right? So they did whatever they needed to do to help the guy out. But there's people within the vehicle that were not happy. They wanted to go. They wanted to get going. But I'm wondering how many Christians kind of feel that kind of pressure in, you know, living a life that's Kodesh, living a life that's, that's holy. Because there is pressure. There's a lot of pressure. And people say, well, you're a pastor. You wouldn't understand that. There's pastor. There's pressure for pastors. Because I, most of the pastors that I'm friends with, none of them walk around with zeet zeets. All right? None of them say Yeshua. All right? None of them say that. They think I'm weird. Before they, I started doing that, they knew I was kind of weird, but now they know officially You're Pastor right. Mike has lost his mind, right? But the thing is, is I've got to make a decision and I've got to stand my ground. And you know what the result has been? Beautiful story. I've got at least two pastor friends of mine that I know. And Robin was talking to me about, she, she's the one that pointed this out. One of them is a little fishing buddy of mine, man. And, uh, but because I stood my ground, I've got one that almost every Sunday now, he wears his, his tallit when he preaches. He's got a tallit. They bought a shofar. They're blowing their shofar during worship. And I'm like, what? And then they did, a, uh, they did a Passover, just like we did, a Passover Seder. Now, they did Easter Sunday as well, but we just, you know, I'm like, hey, guy's getting close, man. Praise God. You know what I'm saying? 
And I thought it was just the coolest thing. And then some of y'all know my pastor, one of my pastors, Mike Phillips. Uh, he's been here and preached before. Um, he's talking about, he's got a Toledo. Now, I went into his library, and he had the, um, uh, I, I can't remember the name of the book, but it's, uh, it's the study of all the, the Torah portions. And it's about this thick. It sits on my desk all the time. That's what I read through for my Torah portions. Um, it starts with a C-H. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Um, if it was in my face, I could tell you what it was. But uh, I'm walking by his library, and I look over, and he's got one in his library. And I'm like, do you know what that is? He said, yeah, I'm going to start reading that. I'm like, what? And so you're influ you don't know how you're influencing, right? Even though it feels weird and you're kind of going against the grain of everything, you know, it is weird, right? I mean, because you're going against everything you've been taught as a, as a believer, especially if you were raised up in Baptist, a little Baptist girl, right? A little Baptist church, or a little Pentecostal. Uh, weren't you Pentecostal? You're a little Pentecostal boy, weren't you? She was. I'm Baptist. Baptocostal or Pentecostal? <laughs> oh, he Baptocostal. Yeah. I used to tell people I'm a Reformed Charismatic, man. That's what I used to be. But the thing is, man, is there's so much pressure because, one, most people don't know. That even Danny was saying earlier, man, I thought it was really good, is that, is that this is new to people, most people. And it's a huge movement, by the way. I don't know. Did you all see my, my uh, I posted a post by uh, New to Torah? Two days ago, yeah, a couple days ago, man, how people are running to tour. And people, uh, I love, that's one of my favorite guys, man. He just such a way. Uh, did you see that? Did you see, great video, man. But he's right. The reason why is because people are opening up their Bibles for the first time, and they're starting to read Scripture, and they're going, wait a minute, what's in here is not matching what's out here in the body of Christ. <laughs> Do what? This one doesn't line up. It just doesn't line up. we got to work on that. And so I love this. So, so he's talking to us about how to have healthy relationships. Because the bottom line, the Torah from Genesis, oh, yeah, from Genesis all the way through to Deuteronomy um, is summed up in, in one word. What is it? Love. Love. The whole law, the whole Torah, everything that we see here points to Yeshua. Everything points to Yeshua. See, the Bible says this. The Bible says that Yeshua is the cornerstone and that they rejected the chief cornerstone. And now upon the cornerstone, everything else is built. Everything, including the Torah, the law, the prophets, is all built on Yeshua. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's the foundation of the Lord. Exactly. And he is the foundation. So even though we're talking about, I mean, Jesus said, hey, love your neighbor as you Where did he get that from? Right here. Because we're fixing to read it, right? Pastor, speaking of the truth in love, no longer what we're talking about, God. Not to oversimplify that, but speaking of God's truth to a situation with love in your heart. That's what God is telling us to do. That's exactly right. Talk to your neighbor, but let it be in love. It has to be done in love, right? And sometimes we say, when you hear see a word like that, rebuke, and, and that really, that can be harsh, you know? And some people, we live, in a, we live in a society today where it is hard. Now remember, we're talking, we're not talking about foreigners. We're talking about Israel. We're talking about the holy ones, the saints, the called out ones, right? Notice he's not saying go to your enemies that are over there in the next city and go talk to them and rebuke them. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about within Israel. So within our church, within the body, right, within the community that we're a part of, when there's an offense, don't let it sit. Don't let it stir. Let's go deal with it, right? Instead, you are to firmly, no, firmly rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Now watch. Now what happens next? You're not to take vengeance. You see, if you're dealing with it right, you won't take vengeance. Now, in today's modern world, I know most people aren't going to go like attack someone who does something bad to you, right? But what will you do? We read it earlier. You'll be a tail bearer. And then you'll develop what in your heart? Like hatred. hatred. So I'm processing where they are at this point because they just came out of Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. They're traveling, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like God saying, stay together, love each other so that you're not making your journey more toxic. Yeah. You're toxic, you know, you're toxic, making everything toxic. Yeah. Because we're going to go to this great place soon. Yeah. 
we want to make sure that we keep it holy as yeah. well, right? And what you're going to find, that's a great, great analogy because what you'll find in that, that they're all, uh, I'm going to repeat it for the camera, that they're all walking together and they have to live together and they're in this wilderness and God is taking them. So God's doing two things. Number one, God's trying to get Egypt out of them, right? Yeah. Just like he's trying to get the world out of you. Right? We have an Egypt. We might not call it Egypt. We might call it Terrell or Quinlan or Roy City or Fate or wherever. Right? We have the world in us. Right? And so he's telling us, look, don't do things like you used to do it in Egypt. Right? What happened in Egypt? What, 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 what amazing story fits what we're talking about right now that is really paramount to the story of coming out of Egypt? Anybody remember? Joseph. Had to do with hatred. It had to do with Moses. Joseph. No, not Joseph. What happened? What did Moses come up upon in Egypt? Two, two brothers fighting. Two brothers fighting. What'd they do? One killed the other one, right? Or no, he broke it up. Or he, killed it he killed another one, right. But they were fighting each other. There was hatred, there was disagreement, there was all this stuff. So that was a natural thing going on in Egypt, right? We're in Egypt, hey. You know, we say, when, you, when in Rome, live as the Romans do. No. When in Rome, live like a believer, right? When in Egypt, live like a believer. So he's doing this whole thing. It's like, man, I got to get this stuff out of you. So a lot of rep repetition. Did you raise your hand back there, Cecil? Well, I was going to ask, is that the reason why they had to walk for so many years before they went to the promised land? That's a whole nother sermon, but I'll tell you why. That's a good point. All right. Why did they walk? Because they didn't want to go this one area through this other, like, I don't remember where. Close. You're super close. But they Dustin? Yeah. Dustin said calling somebody else. Okay. <laughs> Larry? So why did the nation of Israel have to walk an 11-day journey for 40 years? So they could change your habits. They, they, break, break them they refused to go it through this one city. They refused to go into the land God promised them. Yeah, and God told them several times. God refusing, right? Right. They refused. Not only did they refuse. So here's the deal. God promises. Look, they, it's an 11. Guys, you have to get this right. It was an 11-day journey from Egypt to Canaan. 11 days. This was where the promised land was. This is where milk and honey was. This is where no more slavery. Man, you're going to be like milk and honey, man. Grapes the size of men's heads, man. I mean, it's great. So what happens is, right, Moses comes in, picks a couple of people from each tribe. They go into the promised land called the spies. They go into the land to spy out the land. While they're in the land, they see giants, right? And we know this is a biblical story because if you read the book of Enoch, you'll see how the angels, right, the angels of, uh, of, of Satan or the fallen angels had come and slept with the women of earth and created these giants. That's who Goliath was. That's what came out of from Goliath. All right. That's all in the book of Enoch. It's all true stuff. It's good stuff. All right. So we know that there were real giants in the land, but God, man, was going to use the nation of Israel to, to exterminate and to clean house, right? But when they came out, everybody but two of the 12, 12 um, spies that went into the land, only two said, let's go do it, man. God's on our side. We're going to whoop some butt. Let's go. Come on, saddle up your horses, right? Everybody else, the other 10 tribes, which amazingly, how many tribes are lost right now? Ten. Ten. Come on, guys. This isn't rocket science, man. Ten tribes are gone, right? Lost. Now, then we will be restored. Now, Joseph and Caleb were like, hey, if God be for us, who's going to be against us, man? He said we can take it. Let's take it. But they were outnumbered. And the other ten convinced everybody else. And so because they did not trust the Lord and because they didn't have faith and they didn't trust God. Remember the Bible says, man, God same yesterday, today, and forever. Called him Malachi, right? And God says, man, that without faith it is impossible to please the Father. It's impossible. So now Caleb and uh, 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 Joshua are the only two that will do it. So what happens? God says, okay, I'll tell you what. You will wander in the wilderness until everybody that did not believe me is dead. Forty years. The only ones that got to go was Caleb and Joshua. They were the only ones that survived from those original, those original people that doubted. And they got to walk into Canaan. 
right? Pulling this stuff out of them, trying to get uh, uh, Egypt away from them. All right, let's finish our text. You're not to take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but here we go. This is it. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am Adonai. So our job, man, as believers, we are not here. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that's going to go online. I'm going to say it to the guys in here because I know we're gun collectors, right? I know, I know people in here got lots of guns. And you plan on defending yourself. But do you understand that God says not to? Yeah. You understand that when it comes down to it, man, we are not to, like, we're to let God defend us. And he will. And he's going to. You understand that in the end times, if it all comes down ugly, that, A, you're going to lose your head. But there's glory in that, right? Because then you're resurrected on the first resurrection. Go back to read Revelation 19 and 20, right? It doesn't say that the Christians are going to fight. Even in the Armageddon, when the fight gets real and it really gets ugly and good and evil, right? Mega do, you know, all that stuff. You all watch sci-fi movies, right? You've seen it. But there is a battle coming. And it says that we'll fight, but here's what we believe. Messiah is going before us. And it says that, that the sword will be in his mouth. And as soon as he opens it, everybody, whew, gone. He's going to wipe them out, man. Right? And so... I know you got to defend your property. I know people say, well, you do? but we also, this is, this is talking about trusting God, man. It's about faith, right? Let God fight the battle. Let God fight the battle. You must keep my statues. You are not to crossbreed different kinds of animals. You're not to sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor you to wear a garment woven of two kinds of material. I've read so much on this, man. There are so many different viewpoints on why God said this. Many don't understand why God made this a big deal. Um, some believe that the two woven is because inside the temple um, or inside the tabernacle was uh, they were required to wear a certain type of clothing. I even heard one uh, one guy say, and it makes really sense that the power that was coming down from heaven um, was almost electrical, and so based upon your clothing, you could actually um, neutralize that electrical whatever that was coming down from heaven. It was a different take on it. I was like, eh, you know, too big for my brain, okay? But I thought, wow, that's interesting. Um, the, the, the animals, all the different things. God, the, the really, the, the, the biggest thing is it's all about purity. That's what it's about. Yeah, it's all about purity, man. It's that God wants everything to be pure. Remember, we're holy. Right? So now it's different, right? We, we don't have to really worry about that. We, we don't have a whole lot of control on how clothes are, um, but it's different. Uh, verse 20, we know this, man. I'm not going to hang on too long. If a man lies sexually with a woman who's a slave girl, pledged to be married. Now we're going to go into a lot of sexual issues. Again, he's reminding us about purity. He talks about, uh, you know, uh, one of the big ones was uh, we talked about uh, uncovering uh, your woman when she is going through N Nadia, which is uh, her period, her menstrual cycle. Um, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, when you come into the land and have planted all kinds of trees for food, you are to consider um, their fruit as forbidden. Matter of fact, they, uh, Robin and I were kind of talking a little bit about this as we planted our garden. How many are planting gardens this year? All right, and some of y'all are probably experiencing this. When you first plant your garden, you don't get a lot of fruit from it the first year. Matter of fact, it takes a couple seasons for you to really, you'll produce a harvest and you're going to, right? But it takes a season, a few seasons to really get a good harvest out of your fields. Well, that's what God's showing us right here. He said, don't touch it. He said, don't mess with it. Why? He said, man, in the fourth year, you can go back there and you will reap a huge reward. And we've seen that uh, ourselves. What else we got here? Um, you're not to eat any meat with the blood still in it. We've already talked about that. We already know about that um, based upon uh, Leviticus 11. Nor are you to use enchantments or practice sorceries. Man, I'm going to do a video on this one day, man. I am going to hang out here, okay? Because I have like, I don't know if people just do it because they know Christians are on here or what. But here's what we got to get to. Sorceries and enchantments. All right. Can I get on a soapbox without offending people, okay, for just a moment? All right, nobody said yes, so I won't. All right. Disney. 
I know I've got grandbabies, okay? They want to watch all the little magic, little uh, stuff there, man. But man, guys, you got to make sure you are being vigilant on what you're letting them watch from Disney, especially right now. Uh, if you don't watch the news, watch the news a little bit. Disney is bringing in the LGBTQ and making everything fair square across the board, man. Transgenderism, everything. It's going to be open game on Disney. I find that really interesting because I remember when my grandmother was alive, I was probably a teenager, when their feelings upon gays and gay marriages was completely flipped. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why I'm like, why are we all, like, since when did you flip? And now Culture. it's all okay, everybody's all okay with yeah. it. And it's like they forgot 20 years ago. It's a ball the dollar. It's all about that money, man. It is. But Disney, man, for years, man, has been big into even way back to Mickey Mouse, man. I know you got some of y'all might go home and go, man, Pastor Mike's being petty. It's cool. I, you know, hey, I'm not, I'm not raising your children, okay? I'm just letting you know as a pastor, you need to be vigilant. I mean, think about Mickey Mouse and the magic and all that. God said this is not kosher pardon the pun <laughs> you know that it's not cool right and we've got uh, the ice girl with the let it roll let it snow whatever man I mean it's all magic and my little granddaughter was walking around she came in and you know her mom and, and, and grandmother from the other side and she's like I'm a witch I'm like no you're not I rebuke that in Jesus name you are not I'm a good witch though Papa there's no such thing there is no such thing so the other thing that I wanted to attach with this. I won't hang out there long so y'all can breathe now, okay? I didn't call nobody out, all right? So the other thing, man, is horoscopes. Yeah. Stars. Horoscopes, reading the stars, uh, Ouija boards, all that crap. Dude, guys, you got to understand, that is a demonic doorway, man. We don't want to mess with that stuff. You all understand horoscopes, right? Like, like, what's your sign, right? My sign is Jesus. Praise God, it's the cross, man, right? Okay, that's who I am. All right, that's my sign. You know, I'm, but we're talking Libra and Sagittario or whoever you are, you know, and all that other stuff. Man, stay away from that stuff, dude. And that's what he's telling you. Man, this is an abomination. Watch what he says here about this stuff. Uh, Northern Champ is going to go back into it and talk about that anybody that's caught doing it um, is to be killed. And the reason for that kind of goes back to what you just said, is that he doesn't want any of that kind of coming back into the camp. So if there's enchantment, if there's the sexual sins, man, they were pretty rough on it. Not because God is just being this mean old God. God's saying, you're coming out of all of this garbage. We don't want to contaminate this, right? So let me, let me break it down into Christian Eve's for us, right? So... The Bible says, man, that Yeshua died for the ordinances that were held against us. Now, I know we've talked about this sometimes, but it's a good reminder. What are the ordinances that were nailed to the cross? Let's see how much we've grown. Anybody? 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 Bueller? Bueller? Bueller. Anybody know where that movie that's from? Ferris Bueller? 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 Do what? Say again. What were the ordinances? Ten Commandments. Yes, sort of. Not the whole Ten Commandments, though. But what were they? They were the ones that we broke. Don't guess. Let's see if we either know it or we don't know. So the ordinances that were held against us, it means the, the commands that we had broken of the law, right? So if you were a liar, the ordinance that you broke was you broke the thou shalt not lie. Whatever ordinance you broke was what was nailed to the cross, right? Now, I want you to see the parallel here. So God says, hey, don't bring any of this stuff in. Don't do any of this stuff. If you do, here is the consequences of it. And everyone but, the only one that I found in this uh, Leviticus 19 and 20, someone else can look at it for me. The only one that I've seen that did not have a death penalty was one about the exposure of someone that's not your wife or whatever, a girlfriend or something, um, and you see her nakedness but nothing happens. Then you're to be put outside the camp. So there's a couple of them that you were just put outside the camp. Everything else, you were, you were, they had a rock party, okay? And you were the star of the show. All right, and they stoned you. Why? Because God is a vengeful, meanful, ugly, tyrant God? Absolutely not. We know that's not true. We know that he's a loving and patient God. But he's also thirst, he's sovereign. 
He's sovereign. That means God is in control and there is judgment in him. Even in real love, there's judgment in love. And it's not because God's meanful and vengeful, but because God does not want to contaminate his what? Look, right here. His Kodashem. He doesn't want, he doesn't want this. He doesn't want to, he don't want to get this, this like and just be the ones. You're still the one that makes me smile. Okay, sorry. But he wants you to be holy, right? And so it's the same thing today. So Jesus dies on the cross for the sins held against us. And what does that instantly do when you say, yes, yes, that's my penalty. He paid my penalty. What does that do to you? What does that make you? Holy. You're now cleansed. You're, remember last week we talked about atonement and redemption. Atonement was what was due because of the sin. Jesus was that due payment, right? Paid on demand. And then what was redeemed? Do y'all remember what redeemed was? New ownership. New ownership. So now you don't, remember he said, you've been bought with a price. You're no longer your own, but you've been bought. What? You've been redeemed. You belong to God now. You belong to him. And so for us to break this into understanding what God's doing in Israel and what God's trying to do in our hearts is that now we go to the cross, we lay our burden down, we lay our sin down, right? And then what do we do? Go right back into whatever we were doing, right? And God says, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. That's not holiness. That's not being holy. It's not about being restrictive like, oh, God's trying to take your joy. No, he's trying to give you joy. Questions? 2017 is the one that says no death. Say it again. 2017. 2017 what? No death. They get, they get, uh, they, they kind of got a reprieve, right? But now they still got put out of the camp. Yeah, that's what they say. They got, uh, cut off on the side of their people. Yep. That's what 2017 Yeah. Yeah. They were still Israel, but they were cut out. They were cut off. So at least they didn't die. You know, but might as well have because they lost covenant with them, right? They lost the covenant relationship. This is hard stuff. Wasn't some of that stuff to have statute of limitation at the time? <laughs> I don't think it has statute of limitation. God didn't do that. So are you going to keep going down? I'm not. Yeah. All right. He wants me to keep going. So where are we at? The next one. Oh, I know where you're going. I know where you want to go. No, no, Dude, I already know, man. I'm just asking those things too. All right. You're not to round off the hair on the sides of your heads, nor are you to mar the edge of your beard. In other words, you're supposed to take the, uh, this part here and cut it off, right? You're supposed to let that grow. Um, you're not to make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead or make tattoo marks upon yourself. Now, remember, where are we coming out of? Egypt. Egypt. What was one of the things they did? They had a lot of tattoos and piercings. And, and how did they worship their gods? Cutting. Cutting themselves, man. That was one of the ways they did it. Was there, they shaved their heads, too. They shaved their heads, yeah. How did the, they shave their heads, Huh? How did they shave their heads? A sharp rock? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question, man. <laughs> Larry, how did they do that? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Gillette. <laughs> it's an early form of Gillette, man, found in Egypt. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, so go ahead, and, go ahead and comment on that. I know you want to comment on it. Go ahead. I'm fabric-lasted because... You're fabric-lasted? This is where I get the scripture where you know, you're a temple. When you read all, but I've been reading through the temple. It goes all the way back to this one. Yeah. Your body is the temple. You're not supposed to mark it up. It says tattoos. Yeah. But we go through here and it tells you, no, you're fine. I'm, I'm not judging. I'm asking a question. Because <laughs> if you read through here, like, all these other ones love our neighbor, this, this, and you're commanding, you're, you're telling us what we got to do. But when you get to these two, you're not telling us that we still have to do this. So. Mm -hmm. Why are these separate from the others? They're not. They're right, right along with it, man. They're right along with it. See, we're still holy, right? And I know, man, I've got tattoos, and I've got tattoos since I was a Christian. I've got more. Guys, I have tattoos all over my body, man. I, 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 I got more than two, I promise you. <laughs> all right? Robin's got tats, right? And But when we first came in, this is the whole difference between the church, right? And this my mindset was like, hey, I used to even use that scripture. And you know what I used to say? And I know some of y'all may have even used it, right? Oh, that's for the priest. That's not for me. That's for, I'm not a Levite. That was my next question. I'm not a Levite, but look at who he's talking to because of the misinterpretation that we've talked about before, what Leviticus actually means. Some people say that Leviticus means what? 
Remember we talked about it, we did a teaching on it. It means, um, it's the word, it's that V, uh, where it means, uh, some people say it means uh, the priest to the priest, but we actually learned that it means what? Come out or come up, right? Viacrome, is that right, Viacrome? Vikram, it looks like a very, very Viking word when I see it, but. And so this is for all of us, right? Then you have to go and say, well, is, is, if, if you, here's the thing. If you say that part, we can take that part out of context. And I think this is what you're, you're saying is that, well, well, what about the rest of it? So then we need to take all that other out. So if that one is wrong, then all of it's wrong. And I think that's where people get, get misguided from. Would you agree or disagree? I'm, this is study. We're, we're studying. Dustin, you got any comments, questions, concerns now? You're good. Having a great time back there. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> I concur. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that deep insight, brother. Appreciate it, man. <laughs> so as far as tattoos, let's go back to that because Cecil's just opened that mm -hmm. right there. So... I have tattoos. Okay. So if I've decided to be holy now, right? Yeah. Then what you're saying is I'm not. I would consciously not get another tattoo. So let me speak about me, because I don't. I'm not, I don't want to project anything onto someone for them. Right. Okay. So I'm just yes. So now that I understand Torah the way I understand Torah, okay, I would never, for me, I'm never getting, I want to take this one, I wanted to and wrap it down my arm, but I, I'm not going to. Right. Um, for me, I, now that I understand a little bit more, and I didn't understand this before, right. and that's that's a, that's a whole other message that we can get into about grace right. and mercy with other people. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what we're saying, is that, is that here's the thing, guys, here's the thing we have to understand. And, uh, and, and, and this is church-wide, right? And this is why I love Wednesday nights, and I wish we could get more people here because people. I think people will be like, "Oh, okay, cool," you know. Because here's the thing: you only you only know what you know. You know what I'm saying? And if you don't know, God isn't going to go. Well, you should have read Leviticus. But once you get a revelation. Once you get an understanding and the truth revealed to you, we are accountable to what we know. We are not accountable to what we don't know. And this is why I think it's super duper important. And I say this all the time. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it Sunday. Is that we should be more, yes, don't get tats. Don't do that, right? But we also don't walk around going, hey. you know, we see somebody come to church next week and they got a fresh tattoo on, Right? We got to be careful. We got to be gentle, right? We got to be gentle because they don't know yet. And I'm telling you that standing in front of you as a pastor, I've gotten tattoos as a preacher because I thought I knew what I knew, but I didn't. And God was patient with me and he was gracious with me and he was loving and he was merciful and he's so awesome and letting be, he was slow and patient with me, right? Till I came to the knowledge of what I know. And now that I know, now, if somebody who's getting a tattoo and comes to me and says, hey, Pastor Mike, what do you think? Well, thank you for asking. Let me tell you what I think, right? And then now they know, right? Now they know. But it's not my, I'm not a tail bearer. I'm not, I'm not standing up on the port. You know, we're not supposed to be doing this, right? Something Dustin and I talk about a lot that I think is so heavy that we've got to be careful as a Torah observant church. And that is we get to a place where we're like, you know, we're more spiritual or we're better. And, you know, we know because it's amazing truth is being revealed because you're hungry for God's word you're passionate for God's word right and then you forget wait a minute man I mean you know I, I think I told you you know Rob and I were talking about this very thing and it goes really good with what we're talking about is guys I've been in ministry man close to 20 years and it took that long to get me, I'm just I'm a little hard-headed, right? So it took me that long to get me to a place where I now understand Torah. And I understand God's mercy and grace. And I understand that grace and Torah are not at odds against each other. They work beautifully together. And that Yeshua and the law are not against, at, at odds. He was the Torah manifested, man. I mean, it's amazing truth. And there's so many millions and millions of people, man, who don't get that. They don't get it. And so our job is to, that's why I think it's even more important, in my opinion, that we live a Kodesh life. He was the Word in the flesh. 
Huh? Yeah. Water in the yeah. But I think it's so much important that you live, you and I, who know the truth. To him who knows it's sin, it is sin. That's what the Bible says. To him that thinks it's sin, then it's sin. Right? And what he's saying is, once you know that it's sin, it's sin. Right? But you can't, you, uh, God's not going to hold you in account, man, for something you do not know, man. And so that's, that would be my response to that. All right? I wouldn't propagate it. Never get one. I won't, I won't get on the platform and say, hey, go get a tattoo anymore. I used to. My very first message, I don't know if there's anybody here that's been here as long as that. My very first message, it was a message that I created. It was a huge production. The title of the message, matter of fact, I have a tattoo on my back right here. Right here. It's a great big tattoo. Q for where we the Quest Tarot, right? Big old Q on the back. We video photographered it. You know, when you take multiple pictures, like what's that called? Uh, time lapse. We time lapse. We time lapse photographered it at the at the tattoo studio. That was our intro. That was our our intro video. We to put some music to it, and man, we're like rocking it out, right? And, and I did a message series. It said it's it's a big Q, and across the Q, it says Inked. I N K E across my back right here and it was basically teaching that how God has marked us with love you know and certain certain attributes right and I had that on my back to remember forever right that was my very first message on this campus in this room on this well wasn't this platform but the platform that used to be here right so now right and so now here we are nine years later and uh and I'm reading Leviticus chapter 19, you know, with a different set of eyeballs, right? Perspective. Huh? It's perspective. Very big perspective. That's right. It's all about perspective. Way back in my life, I always felt like it was the power in the temple. Yeah. Well, I didn't think it was. Yeah. And it's just different, I think, once you come to a revelation. Go ahead. You could have it removed. Yeah, that's expensive. I've heard it's painful. And I don't want no more pain, okay? So I'll just, I'll just deal with my consequences, you know? I'll just have to look at it all the time. <laughs> all right, so here we are. Do, 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 do. What time? We're almost done, guys. Do not turn to those who are mediums or to soothsayers. Remember, we just talked about the... And that's a lot of Disney, men filled with that stuff, guys, filled with soothsayers, with mediums, Ouija boards, uh, the stars, and uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, astrology. Astrology and horos horoscopes and man avoid that stuff guys look at this it says, do not seek them out to be defiled by them I am Adonai your God you are to rise, rise up in the presence of here we go All right. think about this this is an important commandment right you are to rise up in the presence of a gray haired person <laughs> and what it what it was is just a sign of respect. But here's the thing: we don't respect our elderly that way anymore. And that I mean it, guys. I need you to be serious for a moment because this is super serious. Because the poor, notice this about love: the poor and the outcast, the the people that we don't think we need anymore. Right? The people that are not a part of who we need to be, right? We're, we tend to get rid of them, and, and God says, no, that's not love. What love is, you honor them. Give them the corners of the field, provide for them, and then when they walk into the room, and the older people walk into the room, we are to give them honor. It means to give them room. In other words, if you're sitting down, and your mama or your daddy or an elder walks into the room, and you're in the last seat, you are to stand up and offer the seat to them. That's a command. Not a suggestion. Right? God's way of love and our way of love is different, isn't it? Being holy. Uh, you're to rise up in the presence of the gray-haired and honor the presence of the elderly, so you will fear your God, I am Adonai. Isn't that good? It says by doing that, you are putting on display. You're not doing it for Larry or for Danny, and I'm not trying to pick on you guys. I'm being, trying to be serious. You're not doing it for them. You're doing it because you fear Adonai. And that fear isn't a fear of petrified. It's a fear of honor. It's that we honor God above everything, and because of that, we honor Larry and Janice. We honor Danny when they come in. 
right? And I think we've missed, um, we've, I, I think as, as parents, we need to teach this to our children. Yeah, we live in a world that doesn't teach respect. Anymore. It's all about me, 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 me yeah. instead of God, God. Yeah, awesome. yeah, absolutely, bro. Absolutely, bro. And we're getting worse. Right. It's turning worse. I mean, they're talking about euthanasia and, and getting, I mean, I mean, California, guys, let's talk about children and adults. I mean, we already know that euthanasia is a big thing right now. Um, and then we have in California, thank you, Jesus, and, and you may be pro life. I'm sorry if I offend you, man. But the bottom line is, man, Roe versus Wade has a possibility of being overturned, man. I am celebrating that, man. Oh. And a Roe versus Wade, that's what makes it legal to kill a, an unborn child. But California right now is trying to pass this law where they not only abort a child, but you can do it up to 28 days after its birth. What? Yeah. 28 days after the birth, California right now, it is already passed. It is it is already past the floor and is now going to the next level. Are you? I am dead serious. Go home and look it up. Undertaker, whatever, um, you know, used to be if he would see something wrong that, you know, especially with a little child, he would be able to say something now that also written within that bill, um, you know, no. he's not allowed to say anything. He's yeah. not allowed to say anything. Yeah. I mean, whatever happened to thou shalt not kill. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. Well, it's exactly what it's been. It's been that for for thousands and, and hundreds of years. Yeah, but even still, they're doing it at birth, and they, you know, a child has a heartbeat and all that other stuff at, at 24 weeks, and it's it's fully developed. A child is fully developed in the womb of its mother at 24 weeks. Psalms 139 says, you know, when I was in my mother's womb, you knew me, and you ordained me. God had purpose and calling on a child when he's in the womb. And when we say it's okay, we're saying that's okay. We can't do that no more. And so we live in a world, and I just, I'm just trying to piggyback a little bit on what Dustin said because he's absolutely right. We do not, and I don't want to say we because we're the body of Christ. We need to protect life and honor those who have lived. Honor those that have lived and honor life. You know, they did the same thing. We're going to see this in our next reading when, when they sacrificed to the gods of Moloch. They took their children and they, they killed them for the sake of worshiping their God. Today we do it for the sake of we worship convenience. We do it for convenience. And people say, well, what about rape? What about incest? You know what the statistic of those are? Point zero 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 one. It's very minute. And I'm not, I'm not condoning rape. I'm not condoning uh, incest of, at all. But the chances of a child being born through that, that are very, very slim. They're very low. 99% of all deaths of aborted children are done out of convenience because the parent was not ready to be a parent but wanted to have the experience. Or a teenager. Or a teenager. That, exactly, sir. There's yes, so sir. There's so many people out there that are wanting to adopt. And Amen. That's me and Robin, man. And so, like... That's where Sam and I were years ago. We weren't able to have children, and so that's what it hurt. And now you've got two little ducklings rocking around here. <laughs> he just said be patient. Yeah, he said be patient, be patient. I got one. But, yeah, um, that's what I think about when you're talking about killing an unborn or, like, incest or rape. Like, let God take care of it. If you if you can't take care of the child, let God. God will provide, man. God will take care of it, dude. So much so. So the the so what it comes back to is coming out of Egypt, right? This is all about getting out of Egypt and becoming Kodesh. That's why we were called the Kodeshium, right? To be holy. So holiness is not a bad thing, guys. Man, I know people people don't like it. Uh, let me go ahead and finish this chapter out. Um, you know, I turn to this medium, we talked about that. You know, rise up in the presence of the gray haired and honor the presence of the elderly, so you will fear your God, I am Adonai. If an outsider dwells with you in your land, you shall do him no wrong. In other words, you're not to rob him, you're not to take advantage of him because he's not of, your, of the people. Um, it's about love, man. The outsider dwelling with you, you shall love him as yourself. Holy cow. Well, they're not a Christian, they're not a part of us. He's an outsider, or she's an outsider. You're to love them. You're to love them. You're to have an honest balance and weight. Stop being crooks, man. 
<laughs> I'm not saying y'all are cruising here, but if you have a business, be a good businessman. Don't take advantage of people. Um, I'm Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You must observe all my statutes and all my ordinances. Do them. I am Adonai. See, we don't do it because we feel a book. You mean? A book, yeah. Look at Amos, man. Amos? Amosa. No, it's not an Amosa. Amos? Hey, Amos. <laughs> Go there. I believe it's Amos 15. Is that correct? Nine. Thank you. Nine. What was that verse again? Hey, what page are you on? I am on page 590. What did I say it was? What the heck? I hear you, brother, but I don't hear you. 7 through 15. Look at this. Are you not like the children of Cushites to me, Israel? It is the declaration of Adonai. Did I not bring you out of Egypt? Watch this. This sums up what we're doing. Did I not bring Israel up from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from the Kaptor, and Aram from Kerr? Behold, the eyes of my Lord Adonai are on the sinful kingdom. So I will utterly destroy it from the face of the earth. Nevertheless, I will not annihilate the house of Jacob, is the declaration of Adonai. For behold, I have commanded, and I will shake the house of Israel among the nations. Why is he doing this? Because they won't live holy. Like grain being tossed in seed, without a pebble falling to the ground, by the sword shall the sinners, uh, all the sinners of my people die. Those who say the calamity will not overtake or confront us. In that day I will raise up David's fallen sukkah. Who are we talking about? The tabernacle, right? Sukkah, tabernacle. So in that day I will raise up David's tabernacle. I will restore its breaches, raise up its ruins, rebuild it as in the days of old, so they may possess the remnant of Adam and the nations called by my name. It is a declaration of Adonai. Watch. The one who will do this, behold, days are soon coming, a declaration of Adonai, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, Oh, this is so good. And the one treading grapes, the one sowing seed. The mountains will drip sweet wine and all the hills will melt over. Yes, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel. They will rebuild desolate cities and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will also make gardens and eat their fruit. Yes, I will plant them in their land and they will never again be plucked up out of the land. And I have given them, Adonai your God has said it. What caused them to be plucked up from the land in the first place? Disobedience. Choosing to chase after other gods. Choosing to do their own thing. Walking away from God. Right? God says, okay, I'm going to take you out. But then he promises to bring us back. This is, this is even before Jesus, man. This is grace. This is God's mercy. This is his grace saying, hey, I'm going to restore them. I'm going to restore them. And then he's going to put the word in their heart. And he's going to raise them up, right? And give them the spirit. Cause them to walk in the statues. Amen? All right. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, we are counting the Omar, and we're on the 19th day. 19th day. If you look in your TLB app, there's some cool stuff in there. Uh, so it has, like, how do we celebrate, what does the Bible say about it. And if you click on that, uh, how do you celebrate, there's an Omar booklet. And it takes you, and it goes through each day, and it has, like, scripture in there, thoughts, a challenge on there. And it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Read that. The day of Omar. We are going to be celebrating um, the day of Pentecost on the fourth. Is that correct? Fourth of June. That'll be a Saturday evening service. Going to be a big time celebration. Um, so make plans to be here and join us for that. Invite your friends, family, and all that stuff. Uh, we may or may not have the tables out. We haven't decided. I haven't sat down with the team and, and find out what they exactly wanted to do. Um, but we will be doing that. And part of that, just a little, uh, I might do a video on this. So, but you give you guys part of that is bringing an offering. Uh, it's called a wave offering where when you bring the wave offering, if God has blessed you in any area, sometimes it's food, sometimes it's by uh, finances, however God has blessed you, you're to bring it towards the altar and you wave it before the Lord and basically what you're saying is God, I'm in and that's when you do. It's not a tithe. It's not like your normal tithing or whatever but it's it's uh, it's like but for the year, how God has blessed you and whatever area God has blessed you, then you're to bring it before him and honor it to him and give it to him. It's a really cool um, a cool way of, of doing that. So we'll be doing that this year. So for those who want to do it, praise God. All right. Anybody get prayer requests? No? Wonderful. You guys are easy. 
Praise the Lord. Pray for me. Pray for rest. I am I am tired, man. I am tired. Praise God. Great job, uh, Mr. Uh, Dustin, on on Sunday, man. You rocked it, dude. People are still talking about it, man. Praise God. Praise God. And you did it with a uh, house full of people, man. Which is you know really nice. Yeah, he's still tired. He's still he's still recovering. He's still recovering. Praise God. Amen. I'll tell you. That's one way you can appreciate what your pastor does. That's a good <laughs> Try to preach a message and then you understand. <laughs> why he's tired. And you got to do it twice. Yeah. Wednesday night and Sunday morning, praise God, or Sunday night. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We honor you tonight. We thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you that your word is not a burden, Father, and your word is so truth. Lord, hold and hide your statues on our hearts, Father. If David said, Father, write it on our hearts that we would not want to sin against you. Lord, why would we want to do that? Father, I ask that you'd lead God and direct us, that you'd help us be everything that you've called us to be. We love you so much. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for mercy and truth. Thank you for Yeshua, our Savior. We say all of this and we come before you in his name, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah. Amen and amen. Love y'all.